All right. Amen. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter number 29. Uh, so what we've been doing on Wednesdays is going through a series uh, called Stopping New Evangelical Abuse. And the reason for that is because um, they are very aggressive in a lot of ways towards fundamentalists, towards people like us. Um, there's, there's YouTube channels, websites out there called, you know, Stop um, Independent Fundamental Abuse, Stop um, uh, or not stop it, you know, a recovering uh, Baptist abuse thing, different things like this. And, you know, I, I just, I just can't stand it. You know, it yeah. just, it just really bothers me because just by having a channel, you know, called, you know, stop independent uh, fundamental Baptist abuse or whatever it is, or the home of the recovering Baptist, really, you're not a, you, you really, what they're saying is they're saying that like, they don't have that, a pro that problem with abuse. Right? And we talked about this last week. Every organization on the planet is going to have abuse, at least come into it and try it. The military, Walmart, uh, Fred Meyer, you know, um, just about every church. I mean, we've had people come in here that have tried to cause abuse, you know, but th thankfully uh, we, we do our services in a way to where it kind of helps us to keep an eye on people and to make sure that those types of things are caught early on. For example, it's why we're family integrated. We don't separate children from their parents for any reason. Why is that? Because we don't want to take the chance of somebody creeping in here and pulling a Judas on us and having their way with children. It's not going to happen here. Some people look at that and say, well, you know, what's your youth program like? Oh, you mean I got to keep an eye on my kids during the service and blah, blah, blah. It's like, look, we got a daddy baby room over there. We've got a mother baby room. You'll be just fine. Yeah. Right. But they look at that and there's no, 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 no. We, we want, uh, we want entertainment for our children. We want entertainment for our children, you know, and they mock the way that we do things, but yet they'll accuse us of supporting abuse. Really what they're saying though, is because we preach fundamentalism because we preach the foundations and we stand by those things very strongly. They say that that's abuse. Right. They might not come out and say it exactly like that, but that is exactly what those people mean. Yeah, yeah. And you know what? They have to fall. We have to do damage to them. We have have to conduct ourselves in a way that says, you know what, your behavior is despicable, it's disgusting. And you can even find that in this chapter here. So uh, let's start this one off here real quick. Look at uh, verse number 10, Isaiah chapter 29, look at verse number 10. It says this, for the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers hath he covered. Sounds a lot like new evangelical Christianity to me. Verse 11, And the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I can't, or I cannot, for it is sealed. Verse 12, And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. Verse 13, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of man. Now keep your place there. We're going to come back to it, but go to Mark chapter number seven, Mark chapter number seven, you know, verses 11 and 12 there, you know, talking about how, you know, there's coming a time where the prophets of Judah are basically going to be preaching these messages to the mighty men in Judah. And they're going to be like, we don't understand it. We don't get it. Right. And that's exactly what's going on today in new evangelical Christianity. Right. Isn't that the big uh, claim to their fame there? Oh, well, the King James Bible is too hard to understand. Right. That's why we need all of these Bible versions. Well, the problem with that is very obvious to us, but not so obvious to them. And that is it attacks the foundations. It attacks the fundamentals. It attacks the final authority. Final authority, I think, is probably the biggest battle that we fight. Okay, and that's why we go soul winning. That's why we preach hard on the truths of the Bible is because we stand for final authority. Every organization on earth should or at least does promote some sort of final authority. If you go to the military, they have a final authority, right? It's the constitution or maybe it's their process instructions. You go to work at Microsoft, you know, they have a way of doing business. Every place that you work, they have some kind of manual, some kind of process in place that governs how they do business. That is the final authority to that organization. 
organization. It would be crazy for you to go up to Microsoft or even go down here to Micron and say, hey, let me see your process instructions and just say, I don't think this stuff really means what you think it means. Just toss that stuff out. Say, let's just come up with a new way of doing things. They would mock you. They would laugh in your face. But yet we have most of Christianity today with that attitude, with that very same attitude going around saying that we're abusing people because we're King James only, because we preach the fundamentals, because we preach about the foundations. And they look at us and say, now you're just abusing everybody. And it's because of people like you that no one wants to come to Christ. Well, that's kind of funny because we knock doors every single week. What do you do? Pass out ham sandwiches downtown and pat yourselves on the back. Yeah, that's not exactly working for the Lord. Now, the title of my sermon this evening is Funny Mentalism. Funny Mentalism, right? And it's very simple. You understand what that means. Because I think it, 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 it's laughable. I think it's funny that there are people that go around and say, you know, truth, you know, what, what, what is truth? You know, you, you, you can't put all your eggs into one basket. You can't just say that the King James Bible is your final authority because then you miss out on so much other truth and so much other possible truth that could be dug up later on in life. And that is funny to me. But you know what? You've got a mental condition to believe that you can build your house on sand, that you can build a foundation on, of sand and then, and then build upon that. I mean, Jesus talked about that. We'll look at that later. That is laughable. That's despicable. To think that you could, you know, there are entire cities built on sand today in this world, like Mexico City. You know, I was watching this video about uh, cities that won't survive in 100 years, and that was on the list. It's like sinking like every single year a certain amount of distance. I forgot what the distance was, but it's largely because they built it on sand. They didn't, you know, give it a good foundation. You know, that it's so stupid. It's just so funny to me that these people look at us and, oh, it's kind of bigoted. You know, that apartment complex we've been doing on Saturday a couple years ago, David and I were knocking there and we ran into a, uh, an Episcop Episcopalian guy and he works for the local Episcopalian church. And, you know, he's just like, your invitation is very confrontational. It bothers me, you know, when I see things like King James only. And this guy was literally quaking in his boots. And isn't that what you see going on in Isaiah chapter 29? Well, God's saying, hey, guess what? I'm going to allow forts to come against you. I'm going to allow trials and tribulation and warfare to come against you, Judah, and you are going to be quaking, you are going to be fearful, you are going to be brought low, but yet I will not destroy you. So I had you turn to Mark chapter number seven, because if you remember that verse that we just read there, Isaiah 29, 13, it probably sounds familiar to you, and I want to show you why. You're there in Mark chapter seven, look at verse number five. It says this, then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? Could you imagine going up to Jesus and saying, hey, how come you're not teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? Yeah. <laughs> how, how come you just keep quoting scripture? How come you just keep promoting the Bible? Could you imagine saying something like that to him? I mean, that is crazy. That is funny mentalism. That is a mental condition that is not good, that is not productive, that is not safe. Look at verse number six. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honor, honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of of men. Now you say, okay, why, why bring that up? You can go back to Isaiah chapter 29. Why bring that up? I bring that up because I want to show you that just because this is Old Testament doesn't mean it doesn't apply to us today, right? As Isaiah chapter 29 was being preached in the days of Hezekiah, it was valid for them. So present tense, right? But it also had immediate future application, which we'll talk about here in a moment. But Jesus actually pulled that same passage and applied it in his day. So that means that we can pull the same passage and apply it in our day because we believe that these words are living. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and that it's profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, you know, for all things to be godly and to be righteous in how to run a church service, how 
how to do things the way that God wants us to do. And so obviously the topic today is how the new evangelicals rob people of a foundation to build on. They rob people of a foundation to build on. They attack fundamentalism at its core. You know, and they get a lot of this stuff from the news media because these people are so weak and they're so pathetic. They don't ever want to call anyone out. They don't ever want to call anything out. They'll come after us a little bit here and there. But even when you watch their videos and you go to their websites to talk about us, they're like, oh, but you know, you know, they, they're still good people. You know, there's still a lot of good stuff. You know, they can't just come out and drop the hammer on anything, even when it is against us. And I think that's definitely hilarious. But what does the news media do today? They keep dropping this word extremist, extremism, right? Fundamentalism. It started with Islamic terrorists back in the early 2000s. And even before that, you could see it really popping up, right? And so the world today, they, they view the word fundamental as a bad word. That is a bad word. You know, they'll let you say all these cuss words on, I'm sure on TV or on the radio or, or whatever. But, you know, somebody gets on YouTube and starts talking about the fundamentals or the foundations of the faith. And all of a sudden, oh, we got we to cancel you. We got to kick you off. We can't have people talking about extremist ideas, although it's okay for them to be extreme about their ideas. Because you know what? I think to promote faggotry is a pretty extreme idea, don't you? To promote and to enable pedophilia, that's a pretty extreme ideology, if you ask me. So if you would, jump down to verse number 20. Isaiah chapter 29, look at verse number 20. It says this, for the terrible one is brought to naught, and the scorner is consumed, and all that watch for iniquity are cut off. And so what God is saying, he's saying, hey, there's coming a time where these terrible people, they're going to be brought to nothing. And those who watch out to jump on the bandwagon of iniquity, they're going to be cut off. They're going to be removed. Verse 21, and it says what they do. Look at this here. This is very important. Verse 21, that make a man an offender for a word and lay a snare for him that reproveth in the gate and turn aside the just for a thing of not that's hate speech right there so these people that god's talking about these wicked people that are alive and operating behind the scenes during the reign of hezekiah whom isaiah is prophesying against here it says that make a man an offender for a word well that's what the new evangelicals have done to us they have made us offenders because of the word of god they've made us offenders because we preach once saved always saved and they say well to each his own but we don't really agree with that and you know there's another way and that blah 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 you know it's broad God, you know, just as long as somebody is just acknowledges Christ, you know, who knows? They're probably saved. You know, this Billy Graham type mentality. They've made us offenders because of our stance on Bible prophecy. Now, strangely enough, a lot of new evangelicals are open to Bible prophecy, which I find kind of interesting around here. It must be a subject that's uh, being shied away from. Really, if you think about it, it's the old independent fundamental Baptist churches that really want to come after us for that. But nonetheless, they make us an offender for a word. This is what the media, this is what this country is in the process of doing right now. They're trying to make fundamentalists um, offenders because of what we say, just because of the words. We haven't harmed anybody. We haven't done anything wrong or illegal, right? But what are they doing? They're trying to pass laws that make it uh, illegal for us to preach the Bible and to preach against the alphabet people and all these different things that we stand for and stand against because we have dress standards. Uh-oh. Right? That's one of their big things. Right? Because we preach against divorce. They say, oh, well, see, you're supporting abuse because you won't let somebody get out of an abusive relationship. When have we ever said that? Yeah, we are against divorce, 100%. You know, but it's not like we, we interview people here. Oh, you've been divorced. Well, you can't come in here. Whatever. You can still serve God. You can come in here, serve God, read the Bible, go soul winning, Amen. preach sermons. Amen. You know, just be, just, just, but that's what they do. They, uh, make, they make us offenders because of the words that we say. That's what's going on here in the time of Isaiah. And I'm going to show you why this is so important here in a moment. Now, if you would, uh, let's see here. Well, stay there in Isaiah. No, go to Psalm chapter 11. Go to Psalm chapter number 11. Psalm chapter number 11. And so what we're going to do this evening is we're just going to learn the importance of maintaining a zeal and a sense of urgency about fundamentalism. You should never lose your zeal. You should never lose that drive that you have to support the foundational doctrines that we believe. Fundamentalism. Final authority. This is a big deal. This is a huge deal. The reason why I'm saying that is because look around you. Look at how many empty chairs that we have today. Right? But you could go down to a small group. 
this evening, somewhere here in Boise, and you know what, they're going to have 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 people. And you know what those people are doing? They're mocking us and what we stand for. They're mocking the foundations. And this is why we're so big on soul winning. You know, this is how we fight back. We fight back by preaching the whole counsel of God. We fight back by going soul winning. Look, every soul winning time that we have, every time we train somebody up, every time we bring somebody in here and we make them a disciple, you know what? We deliver a huge blow to these people. That's the spiritual warfare that we are a part of. And it, you know what? It's making a difference and it will continue to make a difference. We show the world by doing that, that we are the real deal. And we're not going to change. We're not going to stop doing those things. We're going to keep promoting that no matter how unpopular it gets. I don't care how many people answer the door with their little masks on and the little syringe sticking out of their shoulder. It doesn't matter. We will not stop or cease to preach the truth about what the Bible says regarding salvation or regarding uh, the pedophiles, the sodomites, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. We will continue to do that. I don't care if it's just me and my family that's left at the end of the day. It's going to be done because it's important. It's the only thing that matters. This country is going to hell in a handbasket. You're not going to save it. You're not going to stop it. You know, we've had people that have left this church and, you know, they're part of these groups around here, you know, the Idaho Freedom Foundation. And look, I don't hate those people, but you know what? They're doing absolutely zero for God. But yet they're, you know, what they're doing is they're on the internet and they're complaining about us and they're saying that we're harming people, we're abusing people, that we're the ones that aren't doing anything. No, you're the one that's not doing anything. You can hold all the signs you want to up down on uh, Franklin by the Planned Parenthood. And guess what? You're not doing anything for God. He looks at that and he laughs. And he says, you know what? You're suffering from a condition called funny mentalism is what you're doing. Because that makes no difference whatsoever. But every time we get somebody saved, you know what? There's somebody who can't become a reprobate. You say, yeah, but where are they all? How come some of them stay at their same churches? You know what? Don't worry because someday those churches are going to fall hard. Because when the government says, hey, we're going to take your funding away. We're going to take your, you know, your, your, your tax benefits away or whatever they're planning on doing. They will fold like a deck of cards. And hopefully at that time, Time, some of these idiots, some of these people will wake up. You say, well, that's not very nice. I don't think it's very nice to not do anything for God. Right, How about that? What about that? Huh? I mean, that's the attitude that I see here in Isaiah chapter number 29. So you're there in Psalm chapter 11. Look at verse number three. It says this, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And the answer is absolutely positively nothing. And this is the goal of new evangelical Christianity, to take the foundation away and give somebody a big plate of quicksand so they, they, they can sink themselves in that and think happy, happy thoughts the rest of their lives. But you know what? They're in for a big shocker is what they're in for because those churches got another thing coming to them. Now go back, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 29, and we'll start moving on here. And so by them doing this, you know, by these new evangelicals saying that we're abusing people, you know what they're doing? They're really saying that God abuses people. That's literally what they're saying. I'll never forget the day that I heard an independent fundamental Baptist preacher get up and say, you know what, you guys, there's some people in here and, you know, you go around and you knock on people's doors and I just think it's rude. You know, you don't have to go up to people and be a jerk and tell them that they're going to hell. You can just have a conversation with somebody. You can go to the park and you can give somebody a piece of candy and just show the love of Jesus. Well, where are all those people at? Where are all the lollipop converts at? Because I'm still looking for them. I can't see them anywhere. How are you going to learn doctrine from a lollipop, from a piece of candy at the park? Look, this osmosis type Christianity doesn't work. It's a failure and you know it. So what we are going to do is back up here, and I'm just going to give some context. So in the beginning of Isaiah chapter 29, God refers to Jerusalem as Ariel. It's just another name that he uh, gives to Jerusalem there. And God is rebuking them, right? He's speaking against them. Now you say, well, okay, well, why is that important? Well, we'll see that here in a minute. But you, you, Isaiah chapter 29, you have Isaiah the prophet receiving this message from God, and he's telling him, hey, you know what? There's going to be uh, an enemy that comes up to you and he's going to build forts against you and you are going to have little to no strength. And so just to kind of connect this uh, in Israel's history. So um, King Hezekiah is king during this time here. And up in Israel, 
the last king of Israel was a guy by the name of Hosea. Now, there's another nation that's coming to Hosea, and that is the nation of Assyria. And their king is a king by the name of Shalmaneser. And you say, okay, well, great, what's the big deal there? Well, if you know your history in the Bible, you know that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, captures Samaria after the fourth year that Hezekiah is reigning, okay? And so it's not until the 14th year that the Assyrians come down, and by then they've had a change of command. They get another king. His name is Sennacherib. I call him Snack on a Rib just because it kind of helps me with, you know, with the names. I'm terrible with, you know, Shalmaneser, Shaman, you know, Shama, all these different things. So I just like to, you know, to, to nickname them. And so this is what's going on here. Hezekiah is reigning in the kingdom of Judah. Uh, the nation of Israel is in the process of being removed. Okay. Now you're there in verse number four, or I'm sorry, you're there in Isaiah chapter 29. Look at verse number four. It says this, and thou shalt be brought down and shall speak out of the ground and thy speech shall be low out of the dust and thy voice shall be as one or as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. Now, what's interesting about this is that in 2 Kings chapter 18, when it's describing the type of king that Hezekiah was, it says there was no king, you know, that was like him before or after him. I mean, he was, he did things that were right in the eyes of the Lord. He was the, he's the king that actually got rid of the high places, which we've kind of mentioned in the past few sermons. So he looks at that and he's like, you know what, I'm going full out for the Lord. But what you have to understand is there's a dark secret that the nation is still hiding, um, that even Hezekiah is hiding. It even goes as far as to say that Hezekiah uh, rebelled against the king of Assyria, right? So Assyria, they're, at this time frame, they've got a lot of momentum. They just captured Samaria. They're taking those people out. They're putting different people from other nations in to the northern kingdom of Israel. And so they're starting to think, man, we're really something here. We're going to be able to steamroll Judah. And so God's saying, hey, during that time, look at the verse again, look at verse four, and thou shalt be brought down and shall speak out of the ground and thy speech shall be low out of the dust and thy voice shall be as of one that hath a familiar spirit out of the ground and thy speech shall whisper out of the dust. So God's basically telling them, hey, you know, the war cry of the brave, the war cry of the mighty is going to be changed to the feeble tones of those that have familiar spirits, which according to Isaiah chapter eight, what does it say about them? It says that they peep and they mutter. They peep and they mutter. So he's basically saying, hey, your mighty men, your strength, your special forces, your armies, their voice, their charge, their zeal is going to literally be brought low and it's going to be brought down as a peep and a mutter. And so the first thing that I want to mention here is God saying that they will have no power in their prayers. It's going to take King Hezekiah to realize, wait a second. I need to do something about this. I actually need to go seek the Lord the proper way. Now jump down to verse number nine. In Isaiah chapter 29, look at verse number nine. It says this, it says, stay yourselves and wonder, cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. And so the next reason that God is going to do this to Judah is because they're intoxicated by ignorance. They're intoxicated by pride. So he says, hey, stay yourselves and wonder, right? Think about this. He's telling them. You know, when you see these forts being built against your city and you look at your king who follows God, he's saying, I want the people to wonder and to think and to examine why this is happening. How could this happen? How could a nation that has a righteous king suffer pain, trials, and tribulations from the Assyrians? Well, one of the reasons is because they are intoxicated by ignorance. They have chosen to reject the commandments and the precepts of God. That's what it says in verse 13. Now look at verse number 10. It says this, For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes. The prophets and your rulers, the seers, hath he covered. And you know what? I would say that same thing applies today to a lot of these new evangelical type preachers. I'm serious. Yeah. You know, you just show them the truth and they're just like, what? I, no, it just can't mean that. 
And I know I harp on this a lot, and it's because it's important. It's because we live in a city that is literally saturated with false religions. Yeah. And the majority, you know, you'd be surprised, it's not necessarily the Mormons. It's new evangelical yeah. type Christianity. You know, the, the, the Nazarene denomination, and a lot of these denominations, they're trying to move away from actually being a denomination. They're starting to hide their statement of faith. They're hiding their names, like Tree City Church. Right? They want you to just drive down Eagle Road and look over. Oh, Tree City Church. What does that sound like? It sounds like your typical fun center. Yeah. Ran by people that have a disease called funny mentalism. Right? They are what are they doing? Well, they're trying to get away from even what they stood for at one point in time. And they're trying to open things up and become broad. Yeah. Why? Because that's what gets people in placating them, scratching their ears. Look, they don't care if they have a regular change out of people just as long as that the, the, it just keeps changing out. As long as there's somebody for them to stick their fingers into their ears and just scratch them real nice and long, they don't really care. They don't. They're after one thing and one thing only, and that is money. Right? Even the Southern Baptists are starting to do this. There is a lot like, what is it, the Summit Church off of Overland over here. You know, I called them up not too long ago just to ask them questions. I do that from time to time. And I'm like, so are you, what, what denomination did you guys come from? Oh, we're non-denominational. Well, how did you start? I, I was like, I, I think I heard, you know, out in town that you guys used to be Baptists. Well, right. We used to advertise that we were like American Baptists or no missionary Baptists or something. But really we're just the summit. You know, we we're, we're just, just about love and tolerating people and just being open to everyone in the community. I was like, okay, well, thanks for letting me know that. What are they doing? They're moving away from the truth. Why? Probably because they've been doing it for years and God is casting a spirit of deep sleep on those people. So when you talk to them and they're just like, their eye, you know, they got the right eye going left, the left eye going right. And it's just like, hey, dude, are you all right? You paying attention here? They're just like, Jesus loved everyone. He's not like you guys. It's, you just realize this is probably what you're dealing with here, the spirit of slumber. Right, so we need to just go out and find these lions that are asleep, you know, and get them saved, get them in here, get them fired up, get them all riled up so that they can help us in this extremely important fight. We are going to stand up for fundamentalism. We're going to make this town know it very, very well. I don't care what we have to do. I don't care how many videos we have to, we have to make. It's going to happen. Look at verse number 11. It says this, and the vision of all is become unto you as the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one that is learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I cannot, for it is sealed. Isn't that what you see a lot of times today? You show somebody a clear verse, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and they're like, you're like, what does that say? Be a good person. <laughs> right? Just, just be good. You know, when somebody does that to you, I'd give them maybe another chance or maybe just stop right there and be like, hey, look. That's not what it says. Okay, this is not even close. Do you even want me to continue? And if not, just leave, okay? Because you're not going to override that spirit of sleep that God has given some of these people out here, okay? Look at verse number 12. And the book is, or, yeah, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee, and he saith, I am not learned. Right? So these people are so desperate, they're just going around, Hey, you read this book. I know you say you're not learning, but can you read it? Can you just give me something? And he, they just can't do it. Look at verse 13 again. Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. That is 100% the new evangelical churches of today. They have the right language. You could talk to them. They say, I have a Bible. Yes, we believe in Jesus. Oh, faith. Oh, this. Oh, brother, ham sandwich, malto meal. They've got all of that stuff down, but yet their hearts are far from him. Why? Because to really go after God's heart is to understand the importance of final authority, to understand the importance of his word and how you have to, you absolutely have to build your foundation, build your walk, build your walk with Christ on a rock. And that rock is him. And you know what? The rock of the NIV is not the Jesus Christ that's in the King James Bible. They are different. 
They are vastly different. So again, the question is, why is God bringing them into bondage and then protecting them? Because we just read the chapter at the beginning of the service and God's telling them, hey, you've got the spirit of slumber. You've got the spirit of sleep. But then he's telling them, you know, these, the, uh, the enemy is going to pitch forts against you. He's going to come after you, but I'm going to deliver you. One of the reasons is obvious and it's because he promised that you know, the seed of David would always be there, always be around. But as you read towards the end of the chapter, you start to get this feel and this sense of the, the times that we're in, right? Where people get taught doctrine and they get learned and they understand. And so that's what he's saying. Hey, there's, he's hinting around towards them that there's coming a change. You know, your, your brothers, Israel, they're gone. Shalmaneser came and he wiped them out. He removed them. I have rejected them as a nation because they rejected Moses. They rejected me. And he's saying, you know, you're really doing the same exact thing. However, there's going to be a change and I am going to make it spiritual Israel, which we've talked about a lot lately. And so go over to Isaiah chapter number 30 and we'll look for the other answer. Why is God bringing them into bondage? They've got this righteous king, this king who loves God, who believes what is written, who is, you know, really kind of like David in a lot of different ways. What is going on here? Look at verse number one of Isaiah chapter 30. It says this, Woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. Now don't miss this here in verse number two. What does it say? that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Uh-oh, we've got a big problem here. Go to 2 Kings chapter number 18. So if you say, why? Why is God prophesying this to them? It's because they are actually taking counsel from Egypt. They have gone to Egypt for comfort, for reinforcements. So... I will show you this here in 2 Kings chapter number 18. So if you get an opportunity when you go home tonight, read Isaiah chapter 29 again, read chapter 30, and then come back and read 2 Kings 16, 17, 18, and 19. And it's going to teach you so much. It's going to help you connect the prophets to the kings, which is a thing that we love to do here because we want to know the Bible better than those that are attacking us. So 2 Kings chapter number 18. So just to give you some context here, like I talked about earlier, Hosea, he was the last king up in the northern kingdom of Israel. Look at verse number four, talking about Hezekiah, king of Judah. It says, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and he called it Nehushtan. Uh, look at verse number six, for he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. This is a righteous king. I mean, this is a good guy here. I mean, I, you know, I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to, to be a fundamentalist and to live under the reign of a king like this. Look at verse number eight. He smote the Philistines. Okay, and actually, if you back up real quick to verse number seven, what does it say? And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. Now, you're going to read here in a moment that Hezekiah does actually pay them a little bit of tribute for a season here. Uh, look at verse number nine. It says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. Okay, so there you go. That's what I was talking about in the beginning there. Um, and it talks about how Samaria was taken away and the exchange of the people there. Now jump down to verse number 13. Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, remember, I call him snack on a rib, right? Just to help me remember <laughs> king of Assyria come up against all the fence cities of Judah and took them. That's what's being prophesied in Isaiah chapter 29, when God says, hey, there are going to be forts built against this city. It's not right then and there while Isaiah was receiving this message, but it was going to come 14 years or 10 years rather after Israel was taken away. Okay. Look, um, look at verse 14. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria uh, to Lachish saying, I have offended Return from me that which thou hast put us on me, will I bear? So he's basically saying, hey, you know, I mean, he's scared to death here, 
right? Hezekiah, though he serves the Lord, he's making a mistake here. He's afraid of the king of Assyria because he realizes, wait a minute, they just conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. I'm not sure if I can stand. I'm not sure if I can take it. Back up to verse 13, you'll see why. It says, now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah, and he took them. So the king of Assyria is now taking ground. He's gaining uh, real estate against Hezekiah, and he's at a loss here. He's not really sure. And look, it, we've all been in that situation before, right? We're fundamental. We go soul winning. We read the Bible. We know the truth. And we're often, th we're always thankful to God for that, that he hasn't cast the spirit of deep sleep on us. But you know what? We all find ourselves in situations from time to time where we're like, oh no, what did I do? Am I going to go through a hard period of chastening? You know, maybe Maybe I, I did something wrong or maybe you did, whatever. And you start to think, how am I going to overcome this obstacle here, right? Snack ribs literally at my front door. What am I going to do? And you, your mind starts racing. That old man's like, hey, you need to go to this person. You need to pay this lawyer. You know, you need to do all these different things. And sometimes we just need to realize we need to back up for a second. And we literally need to learn to give these things to God who is more than able to help us overcome all adversity. So jump to verse number 19. It says this. So basically what happens now, uh, the king of Assyria sends his host to Jerusalem. He sends these guys to communicate a message to Hezekiah. Look at verse 19. It says, And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah. Thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? And that's the question today, right? When people ask us, hey, what, how do you have all this confidence? You know what we don't say? We don't say, oh, because we've got this great library of commentaries. We've got this great foundation of scholars that we go to. We've got this great library of books about the ancient languages, you know, and that's how we have all this confidence. Is that what we do? No, we trust solely on the Lord God and his word that is preserved for us. But this, this is what the Assyrians are doing. They're coming up to the king and saying, hey, how come you're so confident? How come you haven't just given everything up right now to our wonderful king? Look at verse 20. Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? So they're looking at the fact that he hasn't surrendered yet as rebellion, right? But what we're about to read next is going to kind of probably shock you. And it's a big problem. It's an underlying issue that's going on in the nation of Judah, even though they've got a righteous king. So look at this here. Look at this verse 21. Look at what the enemy knows here. It says, now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. You see, this is the big problem. This is what's going on here. This is the answer to the question of why is God bringing them into this trouble, into this bondage? It's because they actually are going down to Egypt to get their counsel. They're putting part of their trust on Egypt. Okay, now go back, if you would, to Isaiah chapter number 30. Isaiah chapter number 30. And then what happens after that is they make threats to the God of heaven. And then you'll actually see this is another reason why God is going to deliver Judah is because Sennacherib is just way too big for his britches. He thinks that, that, you know, that God is a joke. He's like, you know what? The gods couldn't save your brothers, Israel. They're not going to be able to save you. And Hezekiah eventually, you know, he gets humbled and he realizes, you know what? Pharaoh's not going to save me. Egypt ain't going to help me out. And so what does he do? He does the right thing and he prays before God. And God, of course, answers that prayer and delivers them out of the hand of snack on a rib. So again, that is just to support what you're reading here in verses one and two. Isaiah 30 verse one again, woe to the rebellious children, saith the Lord that took counsel, but not of me and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin. So what we need to realize today is that when a group, a organization who calls themselves Christian, take counsel, but not at the mouth, not at the hand of God, that that is adding sin unto sin. Because a lot of people that even go to Baptist churches, they don't think this is a big problem. They don't understand the severity of what they're dealing with here. But look at the attitude that God has towards his physical nation that went down into Egypt to get counsel. 
right? But they're like, well, we're doing both. We, we love the Lord and, you know, we just need to have a backup plan. We just need, you know, Pharaoh and his, his chariots. But look at verse two, that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. And so here's where we're going to move this and make the application for what's going on today. And if you haven't figured it out yet, where do most of these Bible versions get their uh, renderings from? Is it from the, the trusted text, which you know came out of Syria, or is it the ones that came from Alexandria, Egypt? That's right. It's the Westcott and Hort, right? The underlying um, text for you know the, the NIV and a lot of these Bible versions comes from from Egypt. Think about that for a second. What do you think God thinks about that? Every time you read about Egypt in the Bible, it's always negative, right? Pharaoh Nika was probably the best person from Egypt that you really read about, but this is exactly what the new evangelicals are doing today. This is how they operate. They don't go to God. They don't solely trust on him and his power and his ability to preserve his word because that brings division and they don't like division. They don't like confrontation, do they? No, they don't. They don't like that. So what they do, they go to Egypt. They go to the West Cotton Hort. They want to go and find a different way. And what does God say there in verse number one? That they may add sin unto sin by doing that. This is a big deal. This is a humongous problem. And the thing that I want to spend the most time on as we go through the rest of these scriptures today is copyrights. And you say, well, how, what does copyrights have to do with Egypt? Look, this is a huge deal here. How many Bible versions are there in the English language? Hundreds, right? Probably 600, uh, maybe more with maybe, I don't know, five, 10, 15 of them being super popular. NLT, ESV, this, the Christian standard version, you know, the Holman, whatever. We, we can't, I can't even keep up with them. Every time I go to research this and say, okay, I'm going to get an up-to-date list. I just get bored. I'm like, whatever. It, they're all, they all suck. I just think it's easier to say that. They all suck. They all come from Egypt. But here's the thing, right? With the copyright, copyright laws, what does that mean? Why do they need a copyright? To protect their work, but what else? To get money to get money and to preserve that money. So here's the thing. If you're gonna, let's say you're gonna write some kind of a, a magazine. I'm gonna write a, a Baptist magazine here. And you wanna put in that magazine, a verse from the NIV, the NLT, whatever. You have to have written permission from the publisher to legally do that. Do you have to have legal permission from the publisher of the King James Bible to, to, to print King James Bible verses? No. Why is it that you can go down to the dollar store and for a very cheap price, just get a plain paperback King James Bible with no notes, no maps, right? I've had people out in town say, oh no, the King James Bible does have a copyright. I've got one right here. Look, so it's copyright. No, that's the maps. That's the notes. That is something else inside of that. The words are not bound. They are not copyrighted. This is a huge deal because think about it. Look at verse number one again. Woe to the rebellious children saith the Lord, that take counsel, but not of me. So think about this. A so-called Bible committee, they get together and they say, okay, we want to add the 651st new English Bible version. We need it. You know what the copyright organization does? You know what the United States government does? They say, okay, well, that work has to be such a percentage different from the original. Why do you think when you open up the NIV or you open up the New King James or you open up the, the New American Standard, what do they do? They talk about how it compares to which book? The King James Bible. Because they have to demonstrate how different to the, to, in order to get that copyright that it is from the King James Bible, which doesn't have a copyright. But now there's so many English versions out there, they have to be different from each other. Isn't that interesting? So when this committee gets together, think about this. When they get together and they sit down and say, we're going to make a new Bible version. Do they consult the God of heaven? Do they read through the King James and say, how can we stay true to this? No, they don't. What do they do? They consult Egypt. They consult the works of Westcott and Hort. And they make up this doctrine and say, oh, I know. Well, we can just make up this organization called the Original Manuscript Onlyest Organization. And we'll just go to that and say, well, really what this means is this. And then that frees them up in their fundamentalist minds to be able to actually commit blasphemy and change the word of God to take out truths and to put things in there that don't belong. Right. 
Think about that. They're literally going down to Egypt. They are not seeking counsel of God. There's no way you can look at the panel that formed the new international version with a dike on the panel there yeah. and say they sought the Lord. Yeah. What do you think her attitude was during Genesis 19, Judges 19, about Asa, Jude? Right. What was her attitude like? And I heard there was another sodomite on the board too. They're probably all sodomites. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. But one thing I do know is they're reprobates because they have changed the word of God. And they did not consult the God of heaven before they did that. And it is all about money. That's what it's about. It is all about money. Now turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. And what I want to do now is I just want to continue to talk about that comparison thing there. You know, just logically speaking here, you've got the King James Bible. You've got us who are, we believe in the preservation of God's word and not just in the English language. I believe that God's word is in every language, that there are people of all kindreds, all tongues can be saved. That is evidenced in the Bible. I'm not saying otherwise, but what is it like, what is it about the King James and these other modern versions that, that, that separates like like you, you, the, the Jesus Christ that we know the one saved always saved the one who's tough on sin but yet his his grace and his mercy is just exceeding abundant right who is he closer to is he closer to the King James Bible that you all know or is he closer to these modern Bible versions think about this for a second the King James stands alone how many books does the Library of Congress have in it I, th I think it looked as millions right isn't it like I don't know, 15 million maybe, or I'm not sure, but it's, it's a whole lot. It's a whole lot. But how is it that the King James Bible doesn't have that? Right. right? And some people like James will be like, oh, it's got the crown copyright. So you don't have to go to the crown to, <laughs> to ask for permission to use it. The Bible says where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. That is what the Bible teaches. That is what our Bible teaches. So I just want to bring this up here. The King James Bible stands alone because of that reason, because it doesn't have a copyright. You see, when those translators, you can say whatever, you know, stuff you want to about, oh, they weren't saved, blah, blah, blah. You know what? When you read the preface to the King James Bible, they paid great honors to God. At least they said, you know, this is to please you where we just, you know, we just pray that this was a work that, that you would bless and be glorified. You know, when you read the preface to the ASV and to all these other crazy versions, what does it say? This is, you know, I think that the New King James from like the, I think it was the 1982 New King James. If you read the preface to that, it was like finally for the first time in hundreds of years of Bible version that is easy to be understood. Talk about an attack on the word of God, you know, but isn't that what they say about us? Oh, well, how'd people get saved before the King James? You know how they got saved? Because of the English versions that were available before then. Okay. That's how they got saved. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 9. It says, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Right? The word of God is not bound. The King James Bible is not bound in America today like the other uh, modern Bible versions are. So who's Christ more like, the King James or the modern Bible versions? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God and what does it say that the word became what it was manifest as flesh and dwelt among us? And, and we know John chapter one very well. Turn to Matthew chapter number 24, Matthew chapter number 24. So it's kind of funny when you go through this here, the King James stands alone. It is not bound yet. These modern versions are bound. You cannot legally use them unless you get the publisher's permission. In fact, when you do some research on a lot of these new evangelical churches in the treasure Valley, um, they actually express on their websites that they got the NLT's permission to post Bible verses, that they got the 2010 TNIV's permission to put those verses on their website. They're like, because we want to be completely legal. Guess what? We don't have to do that because the word of God is not bound. Our Christ, our Messiah, he is not bound. But the Messiah of the modern versions, he is bound. He is limited. And he is made to be like this genie that does whatever those people want. Why? Because these modern Bible version commissions, these organizations, they went down to Egypt instead of consulting God. That's the only way you can wind up with hundreds and hundreds of these false versions in this country here. Matthew 24. Look at this. 
What does it say in verse 24? For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Go back, if you would, to chapter number 22. So Jesus is telling us, hey, you know, in the last days, guess what? There are going to be false Christs, false prophets that arise. Now, who thinks that it's just going to be a few? No, nobody in here thinks that. It's many, many. First John chapter 4, verse 1, you don't have to turn there. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. So guess what? Isn't it kind of funny that we have like, 600 of these Bible versions, but you got the King James off over here by itself. And, and this is why we, this, it's so easy to break this down. You've got the King James only, and they want to mock us. Oh, you're King James only. That's so, you know, close-minded, blah, 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 whatever. But then they've got all these hundreds of Bible versions on this other side. You know, and it's like, can't you see that that subscribes to what we're reading here in Matthew 24, what I just read for you in 1 John chapter 4, that many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, guess what? These many false prophets need many false tools, and they have that available to them every single minute of their lives. So, number two, the King James Version is constantly under attack by the... Uh, these new evangelical, uh, what do they call them, textual critics. Well, isn't Jesus the same? Wasn't he always being under attack? I mean, just read Matthew chapter 14, right? You know, he's, he fed 5,000 people. You know, the miracle of walking on water. What happens right at the beginning of chapter 15? The, the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees come right after him, right? Same thing here in Matthew chapter 22. He does miracles. He teaches great doctrine. Guess what? The Sadducees cast out on the Bible. Look at verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, right? So they come up to him. These Sadducees come up to him. And they're like, oh, you know, if a guy marries all these different wives, whose wife is she going to be up in heaven? Because remember the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in heaven. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't confess in the resurrection. They might have professed, oh, we believe in an afterlife, but it's kind of like, you know, just this space where you kind of float around and you know it's just happy everyone goes to there it's just a state of consciousness i don't know for sure but it sure sounds like they would say something like that because that's what a lot of these people out here tell us yeah. so a lot of these people who go to these churches around here that's kind of the stuff that they talk about and the stuff that they say right but think about that when you read the king james bible you see how he's constantly under attack right it's like it's jesus against everybody it's jesus and the disciples against everybody else all these false prophets always outnumbered but always comes out on top it's the same thing with the king james bible you've got all these critics all these scholars all these scribes all these bible versions all these churches coming after the king james bible right but guess what they can all be summed up in one phrase original manuscript only is they want to mock us for being king james only but they're still original manuscript only only. There are no logic only is what yeah. they are. That's really what they are. But isn't that kind of interesting how you got all these different versions, all these scholars, you got so many people attacking the what? The King James Bible. You know, it's not like the ESV and the Holman Christian Standard Bible gang up and attack the NIV. It's not like you run into people like, well, I'm NIV only. You might run into one, you know, like odd duck like that in a, in a lifetime. Okay, but by and large, they all literally stick together, even though they kind of compete. Yeah. Why is that? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, right? And just like the Sadducees here in Matthew 22 are attacking Jesus, they're trying to cast doubt on the Bible to sway the masses. He's like, hey, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. So they didn't understand the power of God that he could commence the resurrection and that he will, right? But what else is the power of God? It's believing in the scriptures that he can preserve his truth forever and ever. And so number two, the King James Bible is under constant attack by textual critics, right? It's, it's, it's all of them. They, they, there's so many different organizations out there, YouTube channels, websites, uh, seminaries, churches, and it just seems like, man, what are they? Well, it's just like us, you know? It's just us who've got the King James Bible. Well, guess what? It's, that's, that's Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know, that's the same thing that he went through, right? So which one's more fitting for Christ, the King James or the modern versions? Obviously, it's the King James. Now, just listen to this here. I'm going to have you guys go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And so the modern versions, you know, like I said, it's, it's funny how they all kind of get along with each other. 
You know, uh, that interview that Pastor Anderson did in New World Order Bible versions with James White, you know, he was kind of alluding to this. He's like, you know, I'm sure some of the modern versions, you know, there's people out there just trying to get money. But by and large, they all kind of, you know, come together and all kind of, kind of good. Well, John chapter 5, verse 43 says this. This is what Jesus said. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. And obviously he's telling the Jews, hey, you know, when this Antichrist comes to town, you're going to receive him based off of just his sole testimony of himself. Right. And that's exactly what these new evangelicals do. Right. They say, just trust us in what we say. They point to human achievement, because if you go to a church that uses these modern Bible versions, you can't trust anything they say. And they communicate that to you non-verbally. How so? By saying, well, in the original languages, this is what it says. Oh, you know, reading the end of Mark chapter 16, you know, if your Bible's like mine, it's got a little footnote that says these verses didn't appear in the original manuscripts. Oh, and guess what? The, you know, Jesus and the adulteress, that whole passage, that never happened either. That showed up later on. It's still a good story for us to learn. Who's going to do any work for God with that kind of mentality? Basically, what they're saying is, hey, we're Catholic yeah. and you need to come to us for your truth. But what does the King James Bible say? Hey, you have no need that man teach you. Right. That, that, that doesn't negate church, but it does say that you can go home, take this Bible if you're saved, and you can read it, and you can learn doctrine. You can get zeal, and you can prove whether something is true or whether it's false. Right. That is what it is saying here. And so again, these modern versions, they come in their own name. Just read the preface to them. They come in their own name, and the name of their committee that put that version together. And they didn't even think to consult God, but no, they, oh, Westcott and Horton, their brilliant work in the, in the manuscripts that they found in this trash can, I mean, this bin down in Egypt, oh, these are just glorious. These are just great and wonderful. And so you can see that the King James Bible has the same nasty critics against it that Jesus did. You see how nasty these Pharisees, these Sadducees, and these scribes are to want to cast doubt on God's word in front of the masses, but they do it every single week. They do it every single week. John chapter 8, look at verse 43. Jesus says this, again, under attack. He says, why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word. He's like, you don't understand what I'm saying because you can't hear my word because you're not saved. Look at verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So again, you see the same attributes here in John chapter 8 that you saw in John chapter number 5, that you saw in Matthew chapter 22, that you saw in Isaiah chapter 29. What is it? Man promoting man. That's what you see when you read these modern Bible versions. Man promoting man. That's the whole point of this copyright deal. It, they get around and they say, what can we do to protect our work and get a paycheck every time somebody in America or across the globe buys our Bible version. It is about money. It is not about God's heart. It is not about the fundamentals. It's about being funny because they're all mentally ill is what it's about. Look at verse 45. Because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. And you know what? Sometimes this is what happens out in town. When we tell people this truth, you know why they don't believe us? Because we told them the truth. They've internally rejected it. Verse 46, which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Verse 47, he that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not because ye are not of God. This is why when someone opens an NIV to us when we're out, someone, they're like, well, let me just show you what I believe. And they start to read a little bit and you're like, ah, that's just like nails on a chalkboard, man. It just sounds odd, doesn't it? I've read a large portion of the NIV back in the day. And I'll tell you, it's confusing. So we have the opposite problem. Those of us who are saved, when you read a modern version, you're just like, hold on, wait. Elhanan killed Goliath? What? David's brother? Wait, what? Seriously. I mean, I don't recommend it, but if you ever get that curious, you start to read Job in the NIV, you will be left with your head spinning. It is a work of trash is what it is. It is complete garbage. But what is Jesus saying here? He that is of God heareth God's words. And you know what? We can communicate this truth to a lot of people out there. And you know what? There's just going to be some of them, unfortunately, more and more that aren't going to believe it. They're just not going to receive it. And it's because they have rejected the truth. They like where they're at. They like that human achievement religion. Look at how many sins that I've turned from. Look at how much of a past that I rejected, right? All that 
teaching all of that false doctrine, you know what that does? That promotes these modern Bible versions, and it is a reflection of those modern versions because those committee, those translators, so to speak, went down to Egypt instead of going to God. Uh, let's see here. Go to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. And so I'll say this, modern versions have the majority of support from Christendom. We are severely outnumbered, but yet we're doing more work. You know, I oftentimes I'll be driving just around the city or whatever, you know, doing different things. And I'll look at this humongous church buildings, right? Like we'll go up Meridian Road and look off to the side and see uh, that Nazarene church. What is it called? The, Sh the Shepherd Church or something like Shepherd Valley. I forgot what it's called. doesn't matter. But I look at that massive building and I look at their schedule, you know, 45 minute, uh, service on Sunday morning and then Sunday school and the rest of the week it sits empty and they rent it out to different you know organizations to make their money and I'm just thinking like man they've got all this money they've got all these vans that do nothing maybe they pick people up once in a while I think wow it'd be nice if we could you know maybe get some more space maybe get a couple of vans and and all this stuff but I look at them and I'm like you're you're absolutely doing nothing you're doing nothing for God, but yet you have all this wealth. And that's the same thing you see in the Bible here. The scribes, the Pharisees, they're like, look at our clothing. Look at how God's blessed us. You know, we can even tithe off of our men and all of this stuff here. Isn't that wonderful? Of course, God's blessing us, but he's really not. Because Jesus and his disciples, who seemed poor to them, did way, way more works than they could ever dream of. And you know what? That's the same about this church. We were doing more, and you could say this is ignorant. You can say this is prideful, whatever. It's the God honest truth. We are doing more more work than any of those bozos are because we're out in the community every single week soul winning getting people saved and teaching them truth right we teach people truths all throughout the week it's not just soul winning you know we get them saved and they have questions and we teach them about the reprobate doctrine we teach them about dress standards we teach them about whatever they have questions about we're able to do that why because we sought God we didn't go down to Egypt to get our truth now I know I'm going kind of long so I'm going to hurry up here um, you're there in Matthew chapter number seven. What does it say in verse 13? Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Look, that is a reflection in America of the modern Bible version problem, isn't it? What does it say there? Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way. So there's this broad way out there, and you've all heard it. It's turn or burn. You know, turn from your sins, or just be happy, just be loving. You know, as long as you love your neighbor, you'll go to heaven. People say that to us all the time, oh, yeah. right? There's this broad way, and guess what? It's kind of funny that when it comes to the modern Bible version issue, there's a broad selection. Why? Because there's a broad selection of false prophets that you can choose from out there. It all lines up. Many false prophets, many Bible versions, they preach a broad salvation, they preach broad standards. Why? Because they are fundamentalists. They mock the foundations. They mock being fundamentalists, which is going to be to their demise. So go to Luke chapter six and we're going to be done here very, very shortly. I'm going to wrap this up. So while you're turning there, I'm going to read for you Isaiah 30 verse two again. It says this. So God is rebuking them, says that walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. That is what Christianity today is doing. They have strengthened themselves and the council of Egypt, which the Bible says is extremely wicked. That's the whole point of this copyright thing. That is literally what they're doing. To go out and to say, you know what, we, we need a copyright here to protect our finances and our financial situation. They have gone to Egypt. They have rejected the counsel of God. They're not doing it to just simply make the these and the thous, you know, easier to understand. No, they're doing it to corrupt this nation. And that is an abuse. That is a new evangelical abuse. They want to get their channels up. They want to get their websites up and say, oh, you know, oh, it's the IFB. It's a new IFB that's, you know, abusing everybody. No, you're abusing this nation. And you're the reason why we are going down very, very, very quickly. Luke chapter 6, if you would, look at verse number uh, 46. It says this, Luke 6, 46. It says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. This is the vision for this church. This is why we operate the way that we do is because of what Christ tells us next year in verse 48. He is like a man which built his house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. You know why? 
why someday when we have hundreds of protesters coming at us, why most of us will not fail? It's because we spent the time to dig deep and to build upon the rock, which is the word of God, the Bible that we trust. Look at verse 49. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Look, just about any time one of these new evangelicals gets in hot water, right? Like that church in Ohio, Crossroads that we mentioned a couple weeks ago, right? They had some guy speaking up there and he started speaking against, you know, transgenders just very mildly, right? As soon as the media came against what they do? They folded like a deck of cards. All of a sudden that quicksand just boom, right on down. And they're like, oh, we're sorry, we're so sorry. What would happen if the media came against us? I'd be like, bring it. You, you're weak. I'm not changing anything. This is the word of God. It doesn't go anywhere. This is a strong foundation. And we're going to build upon that whether you like it or not. And I hope it makes you cry. I hope it makes you shake. I hope that we are in your head all night long. Because we need, as this, look, this church, we need to wage war against these new evangelical churches. They are abusing this city. They are abusing this valley. And they are abusing this country. They want to look at us. Oh, you're abusing because you have a tie on. Then shut your mouth. What the hell's wrong with you? All right, I'm going to leave you with one last verse, 2 Timothy 2.19, which says this, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It is iniquity, it is sin to neglect your foundation. Right, look, we all in here agree. We've got the King James Bible. We believe God has preserved his word. You know what? It doesn't just stop there. We need to continuously, week after week, build upon those things. Because when we do, you know what? We're going to be able to stand when the storm comes. And you know what? There's always a storm brewing. There's always something coming, you know, out in the future. But also think about this. You know, just like Judah, you know, they're being told, hey, you got a righteous king. But you're going to have trouble. Sennacherib, he's going to come and he's going to build forts against you. He's going to make you pay him a little bit of money. And your people are going to be brought low. Let's not have that situation here. Let's make sure that we know how to execute battle when we're out there. How to get people saved. How to teach doctrine. How to communicate these truths. And, and what I want to leave you with here is that copyright argument. That is a big one there. Yep. Copyright Egypt. Just remember that. Copyright Egypt. Copyright Egypt. That's the whole point. Yeah. And you say, oh, well, the Mormons use the King James. Yeah, they, they, they read from it, but they don't use it. They don't believe it. Just go talk to them. Anybody out there has got any questions, just come down here. We'll take you to a neighborhood. We'll knock on some of the doors. You'll see real quick they don't believe it. They don't even believe their own Book of Mormon half the time. So, I don't, you know, they, they believe what the Quorum of Twelve Apostles or Apostates over in Utah yeah. tell them to believe. That's what they believe. So remember that. Copyright Egypt. Copyright Egypt. Push that when you're out there. Make people understand the severity of that. Right? And make them know the heart of God. Make them know that God is not okay with that. He looks at that and says, no, that is sin. You should never look at one of these new evangelical churches and think to yourself, well, God's still somewhat kind of sort of pleased with them because he's not. Right. He wasn't pleased with Judah that did that. He's not going to be pleased with them that did that. Right. And we need to deliver that truth to this community before it's too late. Right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Thank you so much, Lord, again, for um, another great week of, of truth. I just pray that you would help us to remember a lot of these things that um, were taught tonight, Lord, and especially the, the copyright argument, Lord. Please help us to articulate this and teach this to the people out in the community, Lord. I pray that you would wake people up all over this city, Lord. They may come in and serve with us and get more people saved before the end comes. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.